Escaped Sapiens. This is a conversation with Professor Thomas Sun-Peterson, director of the Max Planck Institute for Plasma Physics in Germany. We discuss what's happening right now at the forefront of fusion technology. On the one hand, the dream of fusion power is beautiful. Unlimited clean power without wars over resources, nuclear proliferation, or waste. On the other hand, the technology has seemed just out of reach for decades, and even if it does become possible to build practical reactors, will they ever be able to compete economically with wind and solar? I have to say, after this conversation, I'm a believer. Over the past few years, advances in computing power, modeling, and manufacturing, as well as the development of powerful new high-temperature superconducting magnets, now allows for highly efficient reactor designs that would have been inconceivable only a decade ago. And just as occurred with rocket technology and space exploration, private and commercial interests are starting to take notice. This is going to happen in our lifetimes. The question is when. I hope you enjoy. Ultimately, I want to get into a bit of the science story. But before yeah. that, I thought I'd start mm -hmm. by asking you a bit about the more large scale picture. So okay. let's imagine all of your experiments at uh, in, in fusion devices currently. So ITER, Wendelstein, uh, these new spark reactors and all the, these sort of things that are going on in, in, in the States. Let, let's say, for example, that all of these programs are completely successful and we end up with commercial fusion uh, in, mm. in the coming decades. What would that mean, uh, first on the in environmental side, but also on the political side? Oh, I think it would be a complete game changer actually uh, because it's it's an almost inexhaustible source of energy and so it could replace pretty much everything we're doing now so we wouldn't we wouldn't be doing co2 emissions anymore uh, we wouldn't we wouldn't be uh, damaging the environment uh, hardly at all and because it's so abundant you can even imagine things like um, using it to um, convert salt water uh, into fresh water and uh, use it for irrigation, uh, change some of the arid uh, areas into green areas. Uh, all of these things seem seem ridiculous right now because uh, you would be spewing out um, uh, CO2 and, and, and other pollutants. Uh, but this would basically make make energy freely available. I I, w I wouldn't say that it's going to be free or inexpensive, but once you have built the power plant, the cost of running it is is negligible. It's going to be expensive, um, most likely at least. It's going to be somewhat expensive to build it, but once it's there, whether you run it or not, it's going to cost about the same because the fuel itself hardly costs anything. So um, you will think about energy differently and you will also not be um, so dependent on, on the natural resources uh, we have today because you can extract all of this out of seawater. So we will all have it um, in principle. Uh, you just need to, to build the power plant. Uh, you don't need to be in a place where the uh, the wind is steady, you don't need to be to in a place where the the sun shines a lot. You don't need to be near an oil field. You can do this anywhere on the planet, and um, I think that'll change that'll change everything. Also, geopolitical things. Uh, there, there's a lot of conflicts in the world that, that I think are driven uh, by people who have and people who don't have. And we'll be able to have all, have this, all of us. And I think also, I said, it's gonna probably be expensive. It's certainly gonna be high tech. So it might be that we are in the uh, more industrialized countries would have a self-interest in just donating this uh, technology to other countries so that they stop polluting and that they can, they can have growth in their economies without endangering the environment, uh, et cetera. So I think it's gonna be, I think it will be a real game changer. I don't think this is uh, an exaggeration at all. This is one of my main motivations for being in this field, that I think it's not just a little incremental thing. It's, uh, it could be enormous.
Mm -hmm. So this is on the scale. So ITER, for example, is on the scale, you'd say, of it's, it's a fundamental game changer on the scale of the Apollo program or the Manhattan Project or, or one of these huge. Um... Yeah, um, it, it is and it isn't. Um, I mean, I think there are some interesting differences to, to the Apollo program um, or the Manhattan Project or, or things like that. Um, in that this is being done with apparent uh, lack of urgency. Um, I, if you're talking about ITER uh, specifically, um, it's, it's moving ahead at a relatively low pace. It took a very long time to get it rolling. Uh, it is a very complicated construct with uh, contributions, in-kind contributions from partners all across the world. And it's not laid out for maximum speed, um, which those other programs were. Uh, mm -hmm. Those were things where uh, throw resources at it and uh, see how quickly we can get there. Uh, and so that's the difference. But in terms of game changer, uh, it definitely has the, the potential. Fusion has the potential of being an enormous game changer, more so than standing on the moon. Of course, uh, standing on the moon is always going to be an enormous uh, step for mankind uh, that that I don't think fusion is going to beat. But in terms of how our daily lives are lived and and how we can shepherd this this planet in the future, I think it it will have an enormous impact, much much bigger than than standing on the moon, so to speak. So why do you think governments are dragging their feet then in terms of funding and support? To be honest, I don't think that they truly believe that we'll succeed um, anytime uh, soon, uh, and maybe not at all. Uh, the feeling I get is that they are like, well, it could happen, but we don't really believe in it. If they really believed in it, it would be a very different, uh, very different dynamic. It would be much more aggressive, and and the funding would be. Uh, at least an order of magnitude higher. Um, and, and maybe we're beginning to see it a little bit in, in terms of private investors stepping in and also some governments saying, like the British government saying, we want to do this and we want to put in money um, in, uh, in, in large amounts, uh, larger amounts. Uh, but if, if you look this and uh, look at what, at the funding that we are getting, which uh, I'm not going to start complaining about um, because some people think we, we get too much, but um, it's a drop in the ocean uh, of, of the energy uh, in the energy landscape and even uh, a very small fraction of what goes into just supporting energy. In, in Germany, I think it's about 1% uh, goes into fusion compared to what goes into uh, supporting renewable energy sources uh, like wind and solar. Uh, and Germany is not the worst place to be. I sit in Germany right now because uh, we we got the money to build uh, a very nice and interesting experiment, possibly also um, one that will revolutionize the uh, <clears throat> the way we we do we approach fusion. This is the Wendelstein reactor. Yeah. Um, uh, on, on it's this... an experiment, actually. It's not a reactor. Um, I see. Yeah. On, on mm -hmm. the subject, though, of private interest, this is one thing I did want to ask you about. So recently, it seems like there have been private, you know, private interests getting involved, and so yeah. sort of, it's sort of the same as, uh, at least for an outsider, as space expor exploration, right? All of a sudden, we have mm -hmm. all this private interest, and it seems like things are speeding up a little bit, at least from an outside perspective. Yeah. Why why is that happening now? Like, what, what's is it, is there some technology development that's happened in the past years, or is it just is it a social uh, force behind it? And now we're more concerned with climate change, for example. In in your mind, what what's going on there? I think actually climate change is a, a major driver of what we're seeing. Uh, it's it's uh, I think there are a lot of people now who are concerned about the next generations of humans if we're going to have a livable planet and uh, people who have a lot of money and are thinking what what useful should I do to to leave the planet a better place than it um, than it otherwise would have been when I 
one day I'm no longer here. Um, they are now thinking about, well, actually the big thing at the moment that we're concerned about is this climate change and, and CO2 and pollution. And uh, we need to look at the options that can credibly make um, a real difference and can be game changers in that respect. And, and that brings fusion sort of uh, back from, um, back from its position before, which was, yes, it's, it's fine, but it's time isn't ripe yet. And uh, you keep, keep doing, we will support that you keep doing incremental progress uh, because we do see the, the final goal is, is indeed uh, revolutionary, but, uh, revolutionary, but um, it's not gonna happen anytime soon. And it's not that urgent. We don't really think we need the urgency wasn't there, I don't think. And the urgency is there now, and I think it has a lot to do with CO2. On top of that, there are, uh, there are things that are happening um, in fusion and outside of fusion, uh, which just makes it much more likely that this is gonna happen on a finite timescale, uh, that this is gonna happen sooner than this, um, Time scale that always kept slipping away from us, saying that we it will be in about 20, 30 years. And we've been saying that for uh, more than 20, 30 years now. Mm -hmm. um, that, that now actually uh, we have come so far and we're seeing breakthroughs in technology and uh, capabilities in industry that are very helpful for fusion. And in some sense, you, you can say are, are very much part of part of why. Uh, investors can also say now, actually, my, now might be the time to get into fusion because it might actually work out within the next 10 to 20 years. And mm -hmm. it's not this horizon that just keeps uh, keeps being there and you can never quite reach it. Um, and so, so there are technological uh, things that uh, are definitely changing um, the likelihood of fusion being successful. Plus, we've been actually making progress in fusion um, at a at a relatively steady pace. It was it was just not quite the pace that people had hoped for. But there's a number of reasons for that, and we can talk about that. Um, but, but so, is, is is are the advances mainly so? I'm guessing the advances are not so much on the theory side, but more on uh, the geometry of your magnets and the actual material science, right? Is it, is it mainly an engineering uh, progress that's occurred or? It's both actually. Really? Okay. Um, yeah. Um, so uh, I don't know which one I should address first. Um, let, let me, you talk about the engineering, we can come back to that. Um, but on the theory front, uh, in particular, uh, with the Stellarator, which is mm -hmm. my favorite, uh, there has been uh, just an enormous uh, amount of progress just in the last five to 10 years. And uh, before that, there was quite a bit of progress starting in the 80s uh, in understanding why the, why the Stellarator originally uh, did not work as well, in particular in terms of confining the heat of the plasma. Uh, there was a lot of progress in understanding it <clears throat> and also in getting uh, getting tools to address it. Mm -hmm. And um, a lot of that ends up being computational tools. Um, and they benefit tremendously from just computer power. So the fact that computers are so much faster nowadays allows us to, to solve things uh, to a much higher accuracy, to address uh, problems computationally that uh, previously were um, considered that's never going to converge. This is going to take five years uh, to compute. <clears throat> and <clears throat> nowadays it's possible to, to do this in, in much, much shorter times, uh, weeks, et cetera. And then when people start looking into why are, why are the codes slow, et cetera, they find solutions. We have speed up of computations uh, in some cases of, of factors of thousand or a million uh, breakthroughs in terms of um, just algorithms that are better or better approaches um, to a computational or mathematical problem related to um, to the optimization. Because the, for stellarators, the, it is very important that you 
optimize the configuration that you choose the exact right uh, shape of the magnetic field. Um, if you do, if you don't, the plasma's heat will leak out too quickly. Um, and, and we understand what it is that we're aiming for now. And it's been difficult in the past to have the computer power mm -hmm. and the algorithms um, to address that problem um, with sufficient accuracy to make a difference. Could, could I jump and in that and is ask, something we can do now. Yes. Could I, could I ask just quickly, with, with the stellar, looking at the magnets, they're sort of pretty wild, the design. Um, do you have to do active control or is it completely static? Once you've got the magnet set up, it, it's just... You press the button and the plasma uh, channels through the device, or do you have active control with computers slightly changing the magnetic field on the inside? So it's essentially a static cage for the plasma. Um, fundamentally, uh, you turn on the magnets and the magnetic cage is there. Uh, the nice, the cool thing for also non-scientists is that you can visualize the cage uh, because it's there, even without plasma. Uh, we have ways of shooting electron beams uh, in so that the cage itself, the magnetic flux surfaces uh, light up and you can actually see this with your own eyes. Um, this, is, uh, this is something that I uh, kind of came across. Uh, this is a little bit of an anecdote, uh, but uh, this is something I came across quite uh, uh, by luck. Uh, when I built my, 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 my first stellarator at Columbia University, we were, we were trying to verify that we had this cage, that we had the magnetic flux services right before a, a, a big conference. Um, and we had a leak in the chamber, uh, vacuum chamber, so that we had um, a bit of air in there. It was a good vacuum, but it was nowhere near where we had uh, hoped it would be for, for the measurement of, of, of this, uh, of the flux surfaces. Uh, but it turned out that exactly at that pressure, uh, the electron beam that you use for mapping out the structure is visible because it hits uh, particles, it hits molecules in the air and, and they get excited and they, they light up in blue. Yeah. And uh, we, we were trying to do this normal kind of measurement um, under time pressure because the, the conference was coming up. We'd finally gotten the device up and running and wanted to do these measurements that require good vacuum. And we said, let's just try it anyway. We, we don't have the time to fix the leak. And I look into the chamber and I see this glowing magnetic surface in 3D staring at me. I'm like, Wow, that's that's pretty damn amazing. That came from uh, the was, leak of gas into the chamber. The leak of gas didn't make the the, the pattern or the shape. The shape itself is the magnetic field, mm -hmm. but the leak allowed there to be enough particles, enough uh, molecules in the chamber that they lit up as the electron beam uh, traversed around in the. It's cage. like a fluorescent and tube. It, uh, sort of. It's just a, th a three-dimensional glowing object. Mm -hmm. um, so it's very beautiful to look at and, uh, and stunning. And I realized immediately that uh, I built it right because it had the flux surfaces. <laughs> I was looking right at them. Um, it was it was pretty amazing. Is that um, actually used today as a diagnostic? Or I, I thought you had to keep these uh, yeah. chambers completely clean and, and so you didn't want anything inside. And it, don't you have to run them a few times to burn out the, in, the anything that's on the inside? Um, so for this visualization, you actually don't uh, need that. You can certainly have it clean and then bleed in on purpose. Uh, some gas and nitrogen actually works quite well. This is why an air leak uh, worked so beautifully uh, on that on that night. Um, and it gives you very stunning visual uh, because it's in 3D too. If you're looking at it with your own uh, with your own eyes through a window, which is what happened that that night, I was looking into it. Uh, you you can see the 3D structure because your eyes are capable of of seeing 3D. Um, so it's even more amazing than the measurements that we make for quantitative verification that this is exactly the case we wanted. We do that differently. We take this shape and we cut through it with a uh, phosphorescent rod and it lights up in the places where it intersects th that surface and that gives us a very accurate measurement of the shape of of this cage uh, so quantitatively that method of, of looking at this in 3d isn't that powerful 
it it can be used um, for the purposes of verifying uh, the shape, and it certainly will immediately tell you yes, we have a magnetic cage for the for the for the plasma. But exactly whether that's the exact cage we wanted to build or not, these other methods where you indeed have a much better vacuum, uh, have pumped on it, you may have uh, heated it up to outgas any any remnant uh, water molecules. Um, that works much better to get very accurate measurements. Mm -hmm. uh, but to just get the visual verification, there is a stellarator magnetic field here. Uh, that uh, it's it's uh, it's enough to to let a little bit of an air leak into your chamber and it it, it shows up. So that's on the so on the computing side, our computational power has increased to the point that now we can mm -hmm. uh, build very accurate and almost perfect uh, containment uh, devices and mag yeah. magnetics uh, uh, <laughs> uh, magnets. On the engineering side, what what's what's picked up? Um, so a bunch of things have picked up. Uh, I should say that one of the challenges with the stellarator is that um, you can calculate that magnetic field that you want for your, your cage, uh, that you want for your plasma. Um, but then you also need to find out which coils would then produce that. Mm -hmm. And that's also actually ends up being a computational problem. Um, <clears throat> uh, these coils, uh, if you take simple coils, you will generally not have enough degrees of freedom to get the exact right shape of the magnetic field. So what uh, it is possible actually this uh, this stellarator uh, that I that I built at Columbia uh, University was four circular coils. They needed to be placed just right for this to work, uh, but they were very simple coils. But if you want to optimize the shape for fusion, you need more degrees of freedom uh, and this means that your coils, uh, the coil shapes can be complicated. And uh, if you allow yourself the freedom to say my, my coils can be complicated, uh, you will be able to get a better cage for your plasma, so to speak. Mm -hmm. And these three dimensional shapes out of superconducting material um, that you need to be able to make at high accuracy, that is, that is something that um, industry needed to be able to do um, complicated three-dimensional structures, which are really defined by a mathematical description. Uh, there is no simple thing saying, okay, this is going to have a bending radius of, of 40 centimeters over these, centimeter, uh, these few centimeters, and then it's going to have another bend, bending radius. It is a continuous change in shape. Mm -hmm. um, so this kind of 3D, it ends up being a 3D design project. Um, which is nowadays, so what? We do that all the time. Um, yep. We have 3D CAD models. We can do that. And we have, uh, we have 3D printing nowadays that we can, we can use for these things. We have uh, 3D machining. We have all sorts of tools now that have become commonplace and are being used in industry um, that 20, 30, 40 years ago, if, a, if at all available, uh, they were very expensive. Uh, only a few companies uh, available who would do it. And finding the combination of, of companies that can do superconductors and can do three-dimensional shapes was a struggle. So, so this is an example of how technology is making things uh, quite doable. And you will have vendors who can do this for us um, nowadays. And when when the idea came around that we actually need to optimize the magnetic field, and we, this ends up meaning that the coils are going to be three-dimensional complicated objects calculated out of computers. Mm -hmm. At that time, industry wasn't ready to just say, yeah, piece of cake, or maybe not piece of cake, but yes, we can do that. Um, it was a struggle to find vendors to do this. Those who bid, some of them got into real trouble, and uh, in a few cases, some of these projects have led to a company going belly up and saying, "Look, we're gonna, we're gonna file uh, for bankruptcy and maybe start up again because we we won't be able to fill that contract and uh, we're just gonna close up." And that's not that's not gonna I don't think happen. Uh, of course, I can't say that, but it's much more likely to succeed. It's much more likely uh, to happen on a 
a short time scale, it's much more likely to stay within budget today than it was when these things came, uh, when, when the physicists had decided this is what we need to build. At that time, it was really a, a struggle just for the engineering. So with the materials and the computing power that's come online in recent years, do you, if, if you had to bet, you would say, it, it sounds like you're fairly confident that at least within my lifetime and your lifetime, we will see commercial reactors, if you had to bet. Yeah, <clears throat> I, I'm, I'm almost certain at this point. It's a, it's, or, or let me put it the other way around. If we don't, it's because the will isn't there. Mm -hmm. um, the technology is there, the game plan is there. We understand things well. Um, sure, there might be some, some nasty surprises. There have been some in the past, but uh, there won't be showstoppers. Uh, there will be things that we will uh, be able to fix. Maybe we'll need to do an extra iteration. Maybe not. I think, uh, I think it it can certainly happen in our lifetimes. Um, it is really a question of will. Um, if the willpower is there, if the if the funding is there, uh, technology is ready for it. Our our concepts are are mature in many ways. Uh, and um, you were talking about technology things. We were talking about 3D um, capabilities and, uh, that have come uh, online. Uh, superconductors themselves have gone through a revolution recently. And um, <clears throat> uh, high temperature superconductors have gone from a laboratory object that uh, is interesting to study. And uh, maybe one day we'll be able to do uh, uh, room temperature superconductors to this is something that we can use to accelerate fusion. This is something that uh, is at the level of, uh, of maturity that uh, magnets are being built uh, out of high temperature superconductors in shapes that are relevant for fusion. Mm -hmm. And uh, they, really, they, they really go one step beyond what low, uh, low temperature superconductors can do. This is one thing that I had not really appreciated until I started doing a bit more research for this talk. Um, it's not just that they can operate at higher temperatures, right? They can also deal with higher currents and uh, magnetic fields, right? And this right. is this is huge because then that's what you want. You want as large a magnetic field as possible. Uh, and that's the real change. That's the real change, exactly. In fact, the higher temperature is not that important. I think it's going to be useful to, it is useful to operate at 10, 15, 20 Kelvin instead of four Kelvin. That gives you a lot of engineering, um, uh, basically buffer on a lot of fronts. It just makes everything much more robust. Um, but that's not really the game changing uh, part of it. The game changing part of it is that you can go to much higher fields, like you said. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, also, basically the individual wire can take much more current. So it, it will continue to be superconducting at higher fields, but it also will be able to conduct a much higher current density so that you can shrink the superconducting package itself. And, and that allows you to build the cage, not only in the right shape, which is incredibly important for a stellarator, but also at a high enough field. And the field strength is important for, for at least two reasons. Um, the plasma itself, when it's hot and dense, and that's where we want to go because that brings up the fusion uh, power production, um, that will give it a, a finite pressure, which needs to be withheld uh, or with, uh, withstood by something that doesn't touch it, and that's the magnetic field. And the higher the magnetic field is, the higher pressure plasma it can contain. Mm -hmm. um, and so that alone gives us a win if the magnetic field is higher. In addition to that, the rate at which the heat leaks out of the plasma is also dependent on the magnetic field strength. Um, so the, and, and these two things are somewhat separate. Uh, you could say, well, it's both about confinement, um, but one is really whether the balloon is going to pop, so to speak, whether the pressure is so high that your containment device can't hold it anymore. And by the way, in accelerator, it's not, a balloon that's popping, it's more like uh, it begins to expand and you get some cracks at the corners and it begins to fizzle out. 
um, stellarators don't tend to have these kind of explosive instabilities uh, that you think of with a balloon. But the other thing is that the small cracks um, in a stellarator, there are, uh, well, in any confinement device, uh, there are already a little bit, your, your cage is a little bit porous to begin with. So one thing is you can hold the pressure, but the particles are still going to be leaking out. Um, uh, and that's, gonna, that's a diffusive process that's, that's kind of slow and, and um, is benign. And we need, the, we need the heat to come out anyway, in particular when we have the fusion going, but we can't have it come out so quickly that the plasma cools off below fusion temperatures. Uh, so we need it to be well contained and that this, uh, this transport out of, of heat is slow. Um, and the speed at which this happens uh, also goes down with the magnetic field strength going up. So you win on two fronts. You can, you can confine a higher pressure and you can uh, keep the heat in for longer times. But ITA doesn't use these new materials, right? ITA is still low temperature superconducting magnets. Is that yes. the case? Yeah. yeah, and the, and the plan is to continue on with those. Uh, they're so deep into construction that it's way too late to uh, to change that. Um, mm -hmm. You, it, it, it's it's an experiment that was conceived a very long time ago, and mm -hmm. at the time, high temperature superconductors were really not ready to be a viable candidate for for something like ITER. Um, so it just has to live with the with the uh, superconductors that it has. It actually part of part of the ITER construction has led to a mat um, maturation of some other low temperature superconductors, uh, which are now basically performing better than they were uh, before the uh, the ITER uh, project started. So the ITER itself has has also helped accelerate some technological progress, even though they are staying at the low temperature superconductor side for ITER. And um, the high temperature superconductors are, are really only now achieving the maturity uh, where we can think about it. I mean, there's this uh, ex uh, demonstration just a couple of months ago from Commonwealth Fusion of a 20 Tesla high temperature superconductor magnet with a shape that's uh, relevant for, for fusion. Uh, but that's just a couple of months ago that that yeah. milestone was, was, was reached. Yeah. So, uh, it was exact. It was the right decision for Eater to to stick with uh, the technology that was available at the time, um, and it would have been premature to jump into high temperature superconductors for that experiment. But you know, we're making new experiments, so we can benefit from it. Uh, going on, on the uh, so with Eater, so this is the world's large. It's going to be the world's largest fusion reactor, is uh, or experiment is. Um, What's what's different? Is it just is it just that it's larger, or what distinguishes it from Jet, for example, or previous uh, reactors that have been uh, built? What what what's the what does a successful mission uh, look like for ITER? Uh, okay, so in in fact, the size matters. Um, basically, you can think about it as uh, we lose energy on the even us humans, we lose energy on the surface um, and we create it in the volume. Um, so big animals stay warm more easily. Um, mm -hmm. You can have a whale swimming around in the uh, Arctic Ocean and, and be quite happy. And a mouse in the same water would uh, not only drown because it doesn't swim well, it would freeze uh, almost instantly. <laughs> and that's just a surface, uh, surface to volume uh, ratio argument. So a larger fusion plasma holds the energy better. Um, so that alone is uh, important. So that ITER is bigger is important. And uh, ITER also has a higher magnetic field than, for example, JET. Um, and so it, it, it's on both fronts uh, a significant step uh, compared to the devices uh, of, of today. Uh, there are other experiments coming on, online um, that are beginning to get closer to the, to the eater scale. And what happens there is that if you, if you get enough, if you get the confinement high enough, then the fusion process itself will be able to heat the plasma from the inside and you will get this fusion burn. It's like you know, uh, getting, getting a fire going um, with uh, wood that isn't totally dry 
once you have it going, it might be difficult to get it going, but once it's going, um, you can just add more fuel. And even though you, your wood wasn't that uh, dry to begin with, there's enough heat there to dry it out mm -hmm. and, and burn it. So, so you end up with like a situation where you get almost nothing. And then suddenly you enter into this burn regime where the plasma self heats, it gets hotter. The fusion rate goes even further up and you can, you end up stabilizing at some point where you're, where you're actually producing energy and either is going to be just a little bit away from the full ignition burn, mm -hmm. but it, it will be at the point where you still um, you still have a, a candle on on the on the fire to keep it burning, but the energy that's coming out of the, the system is much greater than just the little flame in in your candle. Um, so either is going to take fifty megawatts of input power and produce five hundred megawatt um, of heat out of it because the fusion process itself will will amplify that. But it's not quite where it's ignited in the sense that just add more fuel you, you can take away your your uh, blowtorch it's uh, it's burning and you just add more fuel and it's producing energy that's ignition and either is going to be just below ignition in practice what what is that candle so if so the, the image i have of a of a um of a fusion device is sort of in the steady state i don't really have the image in my head of how you start the burn so right. what, what is it lasers? What, what, what do you use? Uh, no, we don't use lasers, uh, but we do use electromagnetic waves. So lasers are too high frequency to be particularly useful um, in magnetic fusion. Actually, you're right. Uh, if you use a different type of fusion concept, uh, we would be using lasers. But for magnetic confinement fusion, the way you start it up is you start out with having a, a good vacuum. You need uh, the density of your plasma needs to be many orders of magnitude below the density of air. So first you need to pump out, then you bring in some hydrogen gas um, or hydrogen isotopes if, if you really wanna do deuterium tritium fusion burn. And then you have to add energy to the system and the energy is added. Uh, there are different ways of doing that, um, but um, the easiest one is actually adding microwaves. Mm -hmm. um, so just like your microwave oven at home, you can get a, you can get a, you can hit a resonance mm -hmm. that is, so that uh, where the microwaves get absorbed locally in a small region, and uh, that there will be enough, a few free electrons and, and ions that are just a smidget of of a little bit of plasma to begin with. And then once you add the microwaves, they begin to heat up those particles. The particles then collide with, with neutrals, break them apart, and you get more, and you get this avalanche buildup of, uh, of plasma. Um, and this kind of avalanching is something you also see when you see lightning strike. That's, uh, and it all happens so quickly that you, you barely get to see that this starts small and then grows. I mean, with, a, with lightning, we, we don't uh, with our eyes, but you can measure this. Uh, you can follow this with uh, how, how it starts from a small seed and then it becomes ionized. Mm -hmm. um, and more and more uh, particles get ionized. You, you have to continue to, to add energy to it, but now your, your absorption rate of this, these microwaves increases and becomes essentially 100% because now you have many, many particles to absorb on. Um, and then uh, the plasma grows in size, the plasma grows in density and temperature. And you can then begin to say, okay, I'm gonna feed in more particles, I'm gonna bring up the density, or I'm gonna increase my heating power and uh, bring up the temperature or, or do these things in unison. And so you're kind of growing first the plasma as a relatively cold plasma uh, and maybe not so dense. And then you increase the density and the temperature, you, you bring it up and, um, uh, right, and that's uh, bring it up from nothing, uh, more or less. So you start with neutral gas, break it down. You could also use kind of like a spark plug thing to get things going, but then the spark plug itself was going to sit in your plasma afterwards and, and be a sink for energy. So it's not a good idea, but if you want to see a, any plasma, any spark you see flying uh, is, is actually a small plasma that was created and disappeared again. 
but so in, in commercial operation, do you want uh, do you want to run in continuous operation or, or is it pulsed or how, how long does the reaction last for? Uh, right. So this also, ideally, you want to be able to dial this up and down. You want to run this continuously um, for as long as you wish. Uh, you want to have this operate uh, in steady state, but even uh, it would be nice if you could adjust it up and down. Um, say, okay, I want to I want to be producing 500 megawatts uh, huh. right now, but uh, in two hours, we want to go down to 300. Or we want to go up to 800. That's the ideal uh, way. Do you and, control that then using fuel input, or what's what's the what's the dial? Uh, the dial could be the fuel input. That would be uh, that would be the right way to think about it if you ignite it, um, and if you're a stellarator. <laughs> sure. There are so there are concepts that just aren't laid out for a steady state operation. Um, they can't be operated in steady state. Uh, they are intrinsically pulsed. Uh, but could still work as a net energy source. Um, that brings with it a, a bunch of complications in particular for the walls in your device, which will then be cycling between getting a lot of heat and getting no heat. And, mm -hmm. and the, the fatigue uh, problems with that can be quite uh, substantial. And if, if you have long pulses and then uh, long downtimes and then a long pulse and a, a long down, downtime that doesn't isn't controlled by you, but controlled by the physics that doesn't allow you to restart yet, et cetera, doesn't allow you to extend the pulse yet. You're not very well matched to the, your customer. So ideally you would want something that you can dial up and down once it's burning and sitting there. And uh, you with, for example, as you said, adding more fuel um, or changing the ratio between deuterium and tritium is also a way of dialing down the reaction rate. Um, you can change the, uh, the the power output of your of your reactor, uh, so that could be easily uh, controlled. Um, we need to demonstrate this in a real burning experiment, mm. but we have uh, reasons. What I'm telling you, see, is is fairly obvious, and it's kind of similar to what you, how you would do a, a coal or gas uh, powered plant. You add more fuel if you need to produce more energy and uh, you dial the burn back a bit if you if you want to produce less. And I think that's really a, an area where the stellarator has enormous strength because it is a steady state uh, concept. And it can, uh, it can be dialed up and down in its uh, power output. There might be some minimum level at which you will begin to lose the ignition and you're going to have to now begin to re-add some of the heating systems from before because you're at such a low burn mm -hmm. that you're beginning to extinguish your burn again. Um, I guess you could also control things on the other end, right? You've got some liquid, I'm, I presume, that you're heating up and you can probably store some of that or uh, inject a cool liquid into that cycle while mm -hmm. leaving the fusion uh, reactor or process just running at steady state? You could have the fusion process running steady state and then saying, I'm not going to convert this into electricity right now. We're going to, uh, or you can convert it into electricity and use it to do something like aluminum production or something because mm -hmm. the customers aren't there at the moment. You can divert it to other uh, sources or you can dial it down. I think uh, because a fusion power plant is going to be uh, it's going to have about the same cost whether you operate it at full power or not. I think we will find ways in which to use the extra power that it produces in, in useful ways. Um, mm -hmm. that, that there'll be some kind of uh, secondary uh, consumer we, who gets energy on the cheap when the customers don't want to pay. Um, when they're like, okay, well, actually the, the windmills are, are turning at the moment uh, or whatever, we're all asleep and we don't, uh, we don't need uh, energy right now, that you would divert that energy to something else useful that um, also costs a lot of energy, but, but can be turned on and off. In, in that regard, I guess it's sort of like a coal-fired plant, which you can't shut down easily because you've got this huge generator that's rotating that you can't just stop and then restart again. It, I wouldn't want to start a, start and stop it too often. I think the the device itself will will 
will be survive longer if you if you keep operating it you can turn it down and obviously you want to turn it down safely and often if need be uh, if you say okay we see foresee that the next three months there'll be nothing uh no need mm -hmm. for this power plant there's no problem with the fusion power plant to say okay we're gonna we're gonna stop operating and now we're gonna send people on vacation and we're gonna come back uh, no problem whatsoever. Uh, my point is is simply that uh, it's going to cost about the same. Mm -hmm. uh, the cost in the fusion power plant is is building it. Maintaining it is going to be a small part of the cost. And this is different from any other power plants where a lot of the cost is in the fuel. Um, and so you got to dial back uh, for that reason. In fusion, you don't you don't really need to dial back for that reason. It's not going to cost you hardly anything to keep the process going. So maybe you just find some other way of using the energy in the meanwhile, and you don't dial it down. But we, mm -hmm. but but it's possible to to dial down. And if you want to do maintenance or whatever, and uh, or you you literally want to have vacation for your whole staff, in principle, <laughs> it's it's possible. Um, in terms of the fuel itself, though, one one thing that I don't really understand about uh, how a reactor would work is, so you have. You have, I, I guess, so ITER runs off deuterium and tritium, right? Mm. Yeah, that's, so so yeah. you have that in the containment vessel and th then you have uh, this ignition and you're producing, uh, what, it's helium and neutrons and some en energy, yeah. right? So yeah. then you've got helium mixed in in the same chamber as your tritium and deuterium. So how do you separate out... Uh, do you have to shut down the device to pull out the extractor so you can run it and continue? I, What's the exhaust yeah. system functioning like? Right. So the exhaust system is going to have to take care of that. So helium, uh, helium and hydrogen isotopes are, are different molecules and they, they move differently. They have different chemical. So helium ha essentially doesn't have chemical reactions. Um, and it's a bigger uh, it's a bigger atom than a hydrogen atom, uh, and so there are ways that you can separate the helium from the hydrogen. Uh, there are ways we, where we will need to be able to do that uh, efficiently. So so the exhaust comes out; it'll have some helium in it because we're we're burning uh, deuterium tritium in the in the center of the device, and and we'll need to be able to to take out the uh, the helium or take out the hydrogen isotopes. And whatever else, helium and other other uh, components that don't provide fusion. If you have some nitrogen in there, if you have some carbon, whatever, you want to exhaust that too. Uh, you want to take the helium out and everything that isn't deuterium tritium. You actually want to exhaust it unless um, you have some particular reason not to. But generally, you want to exhaust that from the plasma and you want to recycle the deuterium tritium back into the plasma. So there will need to be a, 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 a separation process. And these are possible because they, they are so different. You have chemical differences and physical differences in them mm -hmm. that uh, this kind of separation uh, will be possible. And we're not talking about enormous amounts. Uh, we don't even have a single gram of fuel inside of a, of a big fusion device at any given time. So to, to run something like a 750 megawatt device, some some large commercial station, yeah. um, what what are you talking about in terms of just mass of the fuel over say a year? Uh, so I would have to to give you the exact number. I would have to sit down and do a little bit of math now. But, uh, but hand waving, ball, ballpark hand waving. We're talking about 100 kilograms. Okay, <laughs> it's nothing. So not <laughs> right. <laughs> Right, it's a it's a few hundred kilograms of uh, of deuterium and lithium. Uh, lithium uh, can be used to breed the tritium inside the power plant. That neutron creates uh, can can split lithium into into tritium and helium. Um, yeah. So so it's how just do you start that reaction though? Because you, you need tritium to start, right? Right. So, 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 so do we yeah. have enough? This is the, what I wanted to get into. So tritium is super rare, right? So how do you, how much is there on earth? To, how much do we need to run ITER for its full operations, for example, if, if we didn't do breeding? <clears throat> so for ITER, I don't know exactly what um, its total lifetime consumption would be, but I think the, uh, I think we're, we're talking about, I don't know, tens of kilograms or, or maybe, 
maybe approaching 100. I, I wouldn't, I'd have to do the numbers, frankly. Uh, we're not talking about uh, gigantic amounts, but as, as you say, tritium really isn't available uh, naturally. Uh, it is, uh, it's an unstable isotope. It has a, a half-life of like 12 years, 12 point something. Um, so it's essentially not available in nature. Um, there is no tritium around uh, in nature. So it needs to be bred. If you don't breed it inside your fusion reactor, which is the concept that we um, would be pursuing, uh, an eater might not have that full capability because it, it is an experiment. Um, we would need to have it bred ahead of time uh, or by some other facility. And, and thankfully that is not so difficult. It uh, can be done in fission power plants as a byproduct. It's not something they, they do a lot of because they don't have that many customers for tritium. Um, and tritium needs to be handled uh, uh, with care because it is a hydrogen isotope. You can make uh, a water molecule, uh, a tritiated water molecule out of it, which we are 70% water. We would be, uh, humans would be able to take in tritium very easily. Um, we would also expel it relatively well because we we also recycle our, our water. It comes in and goes out. Um, but nonetheless, it's not something that uh, you want to produce in large amounts unless you have a reason to. Uh, so we don't have that much lit, uh, tritium laying around uh, right now. And it, uh, it's just it decays uh, over 12 years. Uh, it, it probably... Uh, it's a little bit too early for for them to ramp up production for eater. Um, it it isn't really uh, that difficult to imagine a situation. It's not difficult to imagine uh, getting enough tritium for for eater to run. Even if we can say today we we don't have it now, if we say we're going to pay for it, uh, is somebody willing to produce it? It it can be produced, mm -hmm. and the whole cycle in the fusion reactor itself would be breeding tritium at a ratio that you can tinker with and you can make that, you need to make that ratio large enough uh, that it's self-sustained, but you can also make it more than self-sustained and build up a tritium inventory, which could be problematic in terms of what your allowances are, but would allow you then to sell it to the next power plant that's about to start up. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, I see. But so you essentially can produce your own fuel in-house. <laughs> that's the idea. And, and, and so that's, and that's what ITA is testing. That's one of the key um, mission goals of ITA, is it? Yeah, uh, that's part of it. It's, it's not front and center uh, of EATER's mission. The, the breeding uh, of, of tritium is also being pursued elsewhere and can be done if you uh, if you have other neutron sources, et cetera. I mean, it doesn't, it's not a must that, that this be done in ITER. ITER has its mission on uh, the plasma physics side of things, uh, confirming that we can get to this Q of 10, the uh, factor of 10 in, uh, amplification of the incoming heat from 50 megawatt to, to 500 megawatt. Um, that, 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 uh, state is is uh, stable that we can get the helium out. Exactly what you were mentioning before is something that we will be able to study and confirm in ITER. Yeah, that indeed we can get the helium out. We can uh, separate out uh, the hydrogen isotopes. We can recirculate them back uh, at high efficiency. That that the ideas we have there, um, some of which have already been tested and and confirmed and, and others still need to be shown at in in the relevant environment some of the things that we learned from eater definitely relate to that um, exhaust of, of helium and the recycling of the tritium and, and breeding is not going to be front and center for for eater um, but it isn't as big of a problem as in my opinion it's not really a big problem. It really isn't a huge problem uh, because- Because we understand the physics from fission yes, reactors, I guess. Uh, uh, right. And we can use neutron sources, uh, fusion or non-fusion neutron sources um, to study this. 
we can we can produce fusion neutrons today uh, e as long as you don't ask for a net energy gain. Getting fusion is is not that difficult. You can you can uh, you can accelerate a, a beam of tritium into a deuterium target, and you get fusion uh, out of that. It's not a net energy source, but it's a neutron source um, of of 14 mega electron volts exactly the neutrons that would come out of fusion reactor. And you can do studies on this in small scales and these, these scale well. So we all, we know all mm -hmm. what are the cross sections? What are the, uh, what are the rates at which these things are being bred? Uh, do we need to have a neutron multiplier to what extent in the, in the breeding blanket to bring up the tritium production? These are things that can be studied and are being studied. And I think we have a good handle on these, even if we don't have everything uh, planned out. I don't see this as being anything but a development project that we should certainly try and accelerate. Uh, this is one of the areas where we could just give money right now. We know the game plan, we could be doing this. We could be building also facilities that don't have a net energy mission, but just have a, a component test fac facility uh, these are things that we have in our plans, by the way, uh, um, and they are happening, but I think they could be happening at a higher pace if, for example, if, if more money flowed in, if there's uh, more of a need of urgency, if uh, private companies step into this, uh, all these things will, will allow also that component to be accelerated. In terms of ITA, so you said uh, you've got this gain factor of 10. That's, the, that's from the, the heating process of the plasma itself, not from the facility, right? So the right. what 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 gain factor do you need to make this commercially viable? So that depends uh, to get an exact number. Let me just throw out forty. Um, mm -hmm. That's not a bad number. Uh, if you get a, a forty times higher uh, heat output from what you put in, uh, with all the efficiencies, etc., you will be able to make net energy. Now that 40 depends on exactly how efficient is your heating system, uh, how much does it get absorbed, how much electrical power you need to put into a system that creates microwaves. Uh, mm -hmm. There's about a 50% uh, loss in that connection. The devil's to in cool the, the detail. magnets as well, I guess. Uh, the magnets themselves are superconducting, uh, so you need to cool them to cryogenic temperatures, and that is something you need mm -hmm. to continue to cool, but it actually ends up being a relatively small um, cost for your for the efficiency of, your, of the power plant. Um, so, so if I were to throw out a number, where would where would you need to be in terms of of the amplification factor? I think forty is not a bad number, uh, mm -hmm. but uh, if you can ignite that factor is infinity because you're actually turning <laughs> off your external heating sources. You can find an equivalent when you say, well, that's fine. You, you, you turned off your heating, but you're still paying electricity for your, your cryo plant, for your cooling systems, uh, for any, any feedback control you might need. You're going to have to have um, uh, your exhaust pumps are going to be running. Uh, I didn't take any of that into account. True, it's not infinity, but it would be maybe 100. Um, mm -hmm. it, it would be something that really doesn't um, matter much. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Again, I'm 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 uh, I'm talking now within the context of a stellar fusion reactor. Uh, with the tokamaks, it's actually can be more complicated because it needs to be driven in a way mm -hmm. that costs energy. So there'll be more recirculating power um, in a tokamak uh, than in a stellar for sure, and its calculation is a little bit different when it comes to that. And, and can be more uh, problematic, uh, but for the stellarator, it's probably it, it it is basically as I say, the, the the amount of of energy you have to spend on keeping the plant going is going to be a very small fraction of the energy you're producing uh, in the plasma when you ignite it. So the the so you you you're shooting neutrons out of the reaction, right? So this is just like a fission reactor at least naively how does so you must to to a certain extent irradiate the device itself d during operations how does that compare to a fission reactor is it much lower or is it comparable or where where do things sit there um so 
first off, if you make the comparison to a fission reactor, it, I think it's important to, to see that these two are really fundamentally different. In, the, in your context of your question with neutrons, there are in fact a, a lot of similarities. I'll come back to that, but just to make sure uh, that everyone understands that is, um, it's a very different process uh, fusion compared to fission. Not only are, you, are we are we melting the uh, uh, the nuclei together into larger ones instead of splitting large ones into small ones, we don't have anything like a critical mass. We don't need to have kilograms of uh, of fuel stored uh, that could run away from us, could could explode or or uh, give us uh, these issues that we've seen in the in the, in the fission power plants. We have less than a gram of fuel. It's basically like, like we said before, it's just like uh, imagining a, a gas burn. It's just a, a plasma that's burning. Uh, so from that perspective, it really is very different from a fission power plant. But the neutrons, um, the neutrons coming out, that is similar. And so in some sense, <clears throat> and it is in many ways, uh, sim uh, the same, and in some ways, it's worse. I, I, can, I can't say that it is, in terms of neutron damage, it isn't, it's a more complicated problem. Mm -hmm. uh, the neutrons generated from fusion are higher energy than you typically get out of fission. Um, and this means that they will penetrate deeper. You will have uh, a, 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 a thicker blanket to absorb them. There are more chances of transmutations. Um, you will have some radioactivity created over time in your device, but very importantly, your fuel and your, uh, your incoming fuel, to deuterium and lithium is non-radioactive and your waste product, helium, is non-radioactive. So this, mm -hmm. this long-term waste of, of, uh, of a fission power plant does not exist. Now the power plant itself will have some activation because of those neutrons. Um, and so you need to be very careful about what kind of, uh, of uh, materials you use in a fusion power plant uh, because it's very different um, when you irradiate different materials with neutrons, some, some uh, make a transmutation to something that isn't bad at all. Some don't really absorb neutrons very well. And some absorb neutrons very well and create long-lived uh, mm -hmm. uh, radioactive waste. Not at the level of what we have in fission, but if you don't think about this before you build your plant, you can get yourself in trouble. Um, Thankfully, we are thinking about this. And obviously, the, uh, in fission, they have the same problems. Um, they have neutrons also. So there are steels that have been developed. Um, mm -hmm. There are uh, various solutions to this developed in fission, some of which we can take over and work on and, and improve. And in a few cases, we, we are also ourselves developing the materials to optimize this. But we're not starting from scratch. A lot of this uh, can be uh, taken initially from fission and, and in these small facilities that we talked about where you just create some, some fusion neutrons uh, just to figure out how they interact with uh, a breeding blanket or with a structural material. We know very well which materials to avoid and, and which ones have a good chance of, of being, um, mm -hmm. being viable in a fusion power plant. So it's a constraint on the design. Um, to make sure that that the waste in the end uh, is is benign. So what we'll end up with is something that is radioactive, uh, but the radioactivity is going to be so benign that after maybe a fifty year uh, time for it to uh, drop down in in uh, in activity, uh, it could even be reused in a new power plant, or it could be one of these shallow burial things that. Uh, Mm -hmm. that aren't that problematic and, and aren't projecting into hundreds of thousands of years, which unfortunately is the case for, for, for fission uh, waste. So it is, it is an issue, but it's a doable one. I, I guess that's the, so with a fission reactor, you're actually constra constrained by the physics itself because you're just going to have these, uh, what do you call them, daughters from the original um, 
isotope that come out and, yeah. and that's sort of fixed by by what you start with and just what the physics says you're gonna end up with yeah. but here you can control the medium that's surrounding your device to control what is actually produced on the output and and so that's the key difference i suppose yeah they in vision they also need to do that by the way i mean in vision they also have neutron radiation of their walls but uh, since it's such a significantly smaller problem in general than than the than the problem of the nuclear waste itself in a fission power plant, it doesn't get that much attention uh, because it is a smaller problem, a much much smaller problem. That's the only problem we have in fusion, and it is a little bit worse than that very small problem in fission. Mm -hmm. And for that reason, it, it's the thing that we always have to focus on because we always uh, have. To be cognizant of that and, and pick the right, uh, pick the the right alloys, uh, the right materials, right. so that we don't get ourselves into unnecessary trouble. On the other hand, it's also because it's the only thing that you can really kind of throw at us uh, in terms of regulatory uh, issues or or concerns uh, from the public. It's that the power plant itself, over time, its walls, etc., will become radioactive. Uh, so there's a whole lot more focus on that issue in in fusion, yeah. partly because it's slightly worse than in fission, but primarily because the big problem's gone. So you got to focus on this one. <laughs> and we do. Can I ask, um, <clears throat> can I ask a, a engineering question? So the so one thing that sort of struck me when I, I look at um, these devices is you, you have these complicated uh, systems of um, coils that surround the chamber. And so the question I have is, so if you're irradiating the walls, uh, you might get deterioration of the walls and you might need to replace parts of your construction every, I, I don't know, maybe five years, 10 years. But that seems like a really difficult problem when you have these, you know, the, these coils that are surrounding some configuration. Uh, is, is there some uh, engineering solution to this or, or, or um, is this not going to be a problem with uh, commercial reactors? Like what? What's the time scale on which yeah. they they are going to operate, and and on what time scale does damage happen as, as a result of the irradiation from the operation? Uh, so the time scales are are years or tens of years over which uh, this happens, and uh, replacement of parts uh, needs to happen um, on a five to 10, 15 year time scale, maybe. <clears throat> uh, getting these things in and out is something one has to take into account when one designs the plant. So it needs to be part of the engineering concept that things can be taken apart and replaced. Um, also using remote handling uh, tools, because uh, especially if you just turned off your fusion burn, uh, the radioactivity level will be high. Uh, this, mm -hmm. what, we're, what we're aiming for is, uh, is that that drops off quickly and becomes no problem over time, but in, immediately when you need to go in and, and replace things, that will uh, not be the case that it's not very radi radioactive. It will be somewhat radioactive and you will have to uh, be able to use remote handling tools for, for these kinds of things. So that's, that's a constraint on the engineering of the fusion power plant. Uh, it's already something that's being uh, that was done on JET, for example, which operated with deuterium tritium and, and will we'll do some operation again. Um, these remote handling capabilities, the, the ability to access these things that need to be changed out from time to time, um, needs to be part of the engineering concept that you're, that you're uh, pursuing. And uh, ITER has a game plan for that and uh, is developing this. Um, and a power plant itself would would need to come with some a concept that allows maintenance to be relatively straightforward. Um, <clears throat> one, one, one thing you can do in a stellarator is it comes kind of in modules. Um, you can have a stellarator made of five identical modules. That's like a W7X. Um, it could be three, it could be four, it could be six. It's actually a parameter you can play with a bit, but let's take five. Uh, because that's the W7X, you could take that whole um, one-fifth of the device out. You need a spare one-fifth to put back in, uh, re-weld re, re the seams, uh, et cetera, and, and get it up and, and running again. And then this fifth you just switched out. Uh, you now have 
openings, uh, you can remove things uh, and the device is still running because that sixth piece was put in. And so the device is producing energy again, and this piece off to the side gets its blanket replaced or gets uh, mm -hmm. some plasma facing component uh, renewed, whatever the maintenance uh, piece might be. Um, and then a few months later, when uh, again, you, you're you allowed to, to take a dip in your energy production, uh, you can say, okay, now we're gonna replace another part or a few years later, depending on how often this needs to happen. That's one way of, uh, of thinking about the concept. There are other concepts where you can you can take the magnets apart and kind of take the lid lid off the device and and again get access to to these pieces and take them out. Um, so there are there are studies on this and there are even solutions that have already been uh, in operation on the devices that are run deuterium twitching. So even this isn't a huge stumbling block. So what what are so. What are the big stumbling blocks that are not obvious that, that you need to overcome in the next uh, years? If, if there was one uh, key issue that, that really, uh, I, I don't want to say worries you, or what one key issue that has to be overcome at least, what, what would that key issue be, would you say? Well, I frankly, I'm not that worried. Uh, I, think, I do think we have basically a game plan for, for everything. I, I think there are a few things that where we need to accelerate um, what we're doing. I think we, for example, to to take advantage of of super, of the high temperature superconductors, uh, the, the Commonwealth fusion uh, activity is, is incredibly exciting, but they're focusing on the tokamak and they uh, they have now a little bit of a, of a, of a stellarator uh, study going, but, um, that needs to be ramped up uh, uh, to at least an, an order of magnitude uh, larger coil size and, and money flowing into that. That's, that's something, the three-dimensionality of the coils combined with the high field and, and this new material in the high temperature superconductors. That's something that I think we will find solutions for, but we need to qualify these before we go into, into full operation. So that's an area I'm not I wouldn't call it a concern, but it's an area that urgently needs to be developed. Um, mm -hmm. So that that's one area. There's an area of pumping. Uh, we, we talked about this with the helium, the separation of your exhaust from your, your fuels. Uh, there are ideas about this also. Uh, there are uh, also experiments that show that, 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 uh, that this could happen. There are small scale mock-ups of how this works. That needs to be accelerated. That needs to be matured. We need to have um, it ready for prime time. And now it's it's at the point where it's proof of principle in a laboratory. Um, so that needs to that needs to happen. In terms of fueling the plasma, <clears throat> um, there are various ways of doing that and they have uh, advantages and disadvantages. Uh, you, you can uh, just bleed in gas. Uh, mm -hmm. So just get get a, a beam of deuterium or tritium atoms streaming into into your chamber. That's fine for nucleating your plasma. But if you if you then begin to fuel your plasma like this in operation, they will be ionized at the very edge of the plasma. Uh, and once once they're ionized and be become part of the plasma, uh, the confinement of the plasma, this cage works both ways. So it actually takes a little bit of effort to get these particles uh, all the way to the center. Uh, so uh, we can fuel from the edge. There are ways in which the plasma, because the plasma is continually churning around that, that you can get particles to, to the core, um, but it won't give you a very peak den density profile. What you really need is that the core of your plasma far away from, from the, uh, plasma facing components, it's both hot and dense. Mm -hmm. And then the density and the temperature drops. And, and in the end, it, uh, at the edge, you, you, can, you, can, you can have something water, water cooled or helium cooled that touches it. Uh, but to get the particles in deep, uh, we have another method, uh, pellet injection, where we are basically shooting small 
um, we call them bullets, but but they're just real, just small ice cubes of hydrogen. So it gets frozen, and then it gets accelerated, um, typically by by a gas up to maybe a thousand meters per second. This is equivalent to a um, a, a bullet coming out of a gun. Um, yeah. And we can shoot that into the plasma and it makes it much deeper in into the plasma. But if it doesn't actually make it to the core, the core of a fusion plasma is gonna be so hot that it would only make it in uh, to a fraction of that, a small fraction even. So fueling in the core would require either that the plasma helps us in some form that it brings in the particles if you have a high density at the edge, the plasma will try and relax to bring them into the core. Um, or that you have something uh, like this pellet injection, which is even higher speed than what we can do today. So it comes in deeper. That's something where I think we could be yeah. spending some time on and, and money on developing even better uh, fueling systems, uh, these injection systems. Um, so we should be working on that too. Um, the system that we have on this device um, is being produced in the US right now and it will be world leading. So we're taking steps in the right direction. Um, I would wish that there would be an aggressive program to continue that development and, um, and go in the direction of even higher pellet speeds, uh, deeper penetration into your plasma. Um, so those, those are some of the areas that I see we, we would get a lot of um, immediate uh, benefits out of uh, putting money in, in those directions. Plus, one more, these things about remote handling and integrating all of these things, integrating uh, the helium exhaust, the tritium recycling, the breeding, um, the, the fusion burn, the magnets. Uh, the magnets themselves also need to be sufficiently shielded from the neutrons. Um, integrating all of this into a thought through self-consistent power plant design is also something we can start today, but haven't done yet for the Stellarator. We've mm -hmm. done conceptual designs. I'm working on, on some very basic conceptual operating points um, at the moment, but, th but they're completely from, as from a very narrow scope. They're, they're think I'm thinking about what is the right uh, burn point for the plasma, how does it interact with the walls? I'm not thinking about the, the breeding blanket. I'm not thinking about the, uh, the tritium extraction breeding ratios. Uh, exactly which coolant should we be using? There are plenty of things that one should be doing also that uh, we just at the moment don't really have the resources for and where I'm really excited to see money going into projects like uh, like the uh, the ARC uh, project at uh, uh, Commonwealth yeah. Fusion, because they are now in that phase where they are thinking these problems through in the tokamak um, context. And we need that for the Stellarator context. If you want to uh, pursue another alternative concept, um, you need to think these things through also and have a game plan for all of this and really be ready to build this thing at this point, if you said start building tomorrow, I would say I need to do to do a proper engineering uh, feasibility study and uh, conceptual design for all of those things, an integrated solution for all of these things, and and that's what they're doing. These companies that are getting money now, uh, they're now ramping up in in that direction and and getting their designs ready, whatever risks might be there that can be uh, mitigated or retired with mock-ups and, and ex experiments are, are being done in parallel. That's what we need to do with the Stellarator also. And so there is a bunch of things. I'm not, I, I'm not really personally not worried about anything that's a real showstopper that we definitely need to uh, be addressing. Also, because this device where I'm sitting now has retired some of those. I mean, had you asked me this problem mm. two years ago or five years ago, I would have said, we still need to show that the Stellarator, once it's optimized, can confine plasma very well, even at high temperatures, both for the electrons and the ions. We showed that. We need to show 
uh, that we can build these things to the accuracy required. We've showed that, we've shown that, and we've, we've published these things recently. Um, there are a few more things, some important things that we would like to show, um, and we will be showing, hopefully. I'm not worried about them not being shown. I believe that those are things where there is little uncertainty in our predictions. And there are maybe maybe a few areas where it's a little bit more gray, um, but mostly it's a question of, of getting an integrated design going. Having said all that, I, I realize there's one little area that that is is one that needs a, where we need a bit better understanding of what's going on, um, and and that comes back to what's been hampering fusion uh, for for decades um, that turbulence in the plasma uh, creates a much faster diffusion of the heat uh, out of the core to the edge than uh, what one would calculate if you don't take turbulence into account. Mm -hmm. um, and that's an issue. Tur turbulence itself is a, is a complicated uh, phenomenon that involves nonlinear equations that uh, we, even, even the equations where we make uh, simplifications are still very complicated and, and need to be uh, solved on computers. And we're getting to the point now where we have a good handle on uh, on those processes, and we are approaching being able to make um, solid predictions for things we haven't built yet. I think we are we are reaching that point at this stage in fusion, and this is also a reason why we're fairly confident about the project projections for ITER. All that's taken into account in ITER. Um, for the stellarator, there's a chance of uh, of optimizing a bit um, in in that regime also, which hasn't been explored much uh, until now. So the optimization uh, of turbulent transport, trying to bring it down to a level where it um, wouldn't be hampering uh, ignition is something where if it really turns out uh, unexpectedly uh, bad, it could, it could actually affect this, the, the mission of a, of a stellarator power plant. So I, I would say that is an area where I don't have a hundred percent confidence uh, that uh, we have the game plan ready. Um, we have some very, uh, we have some experiments here that, uh, that show that the turbulence can be suppressed and you can get very, very good uh, confinement. Um, but they require that you massage your, your profiles of, of density just right. And then you come back to this thing about the fueling and whether you can really control those density profiles. So, okay, there's an area here where I'm not not 100% sure that everything's gonna be so easy. <laughs> but let's say, let's say, for example, you, you took the stellarated designs from, uh, or concept from Wendelstein, and you took the high temperature superconductors from the spark or arc reactors, and then you did it all at the scale of ITER. Uh, let, let's say the magic funding fairy comes along and allows you to do this mm -hmm. tomorrow. Yeah. What do you think, what do you think you could deliver tomorrow with, with the scale and these two design elements built in? Uh, you, you asking me about the time scale, um, or no, 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 no. Uh, so for example, the, the gain factor, for example, what, what do right. you think you could achieve, um, at that scale with the, these new technologies that are coming in? And designs. Uh, I think we could produce an ignited burn, uh, so Q of infinity, if you will. Uh, we could produce a stellarator power plant that would be producing energy without uh, needing extra heating. Um, and it, right? Uh, I, I think I think it's it has it has less uncertainties than many other concepts because that cage. Is so so determines everything. Uh, whereas in many other concepts, you're asking the plasma to help you along, which also means that those other concepts have much uh, much simpler coils, or maybe a few of these concepts have no coils. They they drive a current through the plasma, and it the current itself creates the magnetic field, and 
um, <clears throat> maybe that's even enough for them to have uh, fusion energy production. It's not entirely out of the question. I, I think they're uh, being a bit optimistic. Um, the Stellarator has these complicated coils, but it gives you a stiff cage that you can calculate ahead of time what will the plasma be doing, um, with the possible exception of the turbulent transport, where we will need to build in some margin, basically, because we are not sure exactly how that's going to pan out. You would need to build the- That's an engineering concern. The turbulence is also a physics concern in the sense that your burn, um, if you're if your fire continues to, to have uh, sprinkles of water on it, uh, it will also be extinguished. Um, and if turbulence basically takes the heat out of your burn process too quickly, you could also uh, lose ignition and or never reach it. So turbulence itself is something you need to take very seriously. My, my point is with the uh, margin is, if you say I'm going to take a conservative approach to that, I'm going to to build my power plant with the money that that you've now given me. A bit more expensive than it might have been otherwise, so that I have margin on that front. Even if the turbulence is worse than I thought it might be, it will still ignite because I actually built it 30% bigger than I needed to, according to my own calculations. But I built in that uncertainty. Um, in the design by making the device bigger, by making the magnetic field a bit larger, um, so that I took it into account and it's gonna burn anyway. And then I might have to, if everything then works out, tell the investors, look, we could have actually built it this smaller and we, you guys would have saved 30, 40% on your investment, uh, but we weren't that brave about uh, the turbulent transport. We were conservative. We thought, let's just make sure it burns and then next generation can benefit mm -hmm. from, from the insight we've gained in, in that. So that's the way I, I would approach these things that are uh, where there's still some uncertainty. I would build in margin and say, OK, we're just going to have to build this a bit more conservatively. We're going to uh, maybe also not run the magnets all the way up to their theoretical limits. Uh, we're going to add a little bit of extra steel here or there. We're, we're going to build the machine a little bit bigger. We're going to have extra pumping capabilities. We're going to build in margin to take care of the risks that we see. There are a few areas where we where we're not entirely confident that we can predict. Uh, and then you could you could actually be building a, a power plant today. I mean, either could have been built so that it would ignite. Um, the, the original mission um, was basically uh, to have an ignited plasma. And then it was said that it was too expensive. Um, there were a, a set of concerns about the big eater. And then yeah. and there were also some new results showing that if you are a little bit more clever than the original design of eater, if you change the shape of your tokamak a bit, you might actually get away with building a smaller eater. Um, mm -hmm. So you put in a little bit of extra risk in performance and you and they, they, they basically made a, a smaller, less expensive device. Um, mm. But in the, in the meanwhile, uh, with, with our uh, understanding maturing, uh, it be became fairly clear that, th that the rosy scenario of either igniting is at this point unlikely, and that this Q of 10 mm. is a robust prediction. And we don't want to promise anything more than that, because that's what our codes are telling us. Mm -hmm. um, and we could have said for the tokamak, let's just build in margin, let's just build it bigger and it will ignite. It will reach Q of 10, it'll reach Q of 20, 40. Uh, it would just be more expensive uh, to do so. That uh, was in some sense the original plan and then you get told, no, you gotta reduce cost. You gotta um, maybe also reduce time, which is something I'm very much in favor of. But um, I don't think we wanna give away margins on in the regions where we have uncertainty. I would much rather build something that that's robust. It's maybe a little bit more expensive than than any than mm -hmm. they could have been, but but will reach the mission even under uncertainties. In terms of commercialization, so ITO was what did it it's tens of billions, right? Mm -hmm. It's it's yeah. quite quite a lot. So 
in terms of commercialization, once you've ironed out these problems and you can bring costs down, will so already people talk about fission reactors not being economically viable. Yeah. Right. Is 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 this something where um, because the fuel is essentially free, um, the cost of operations will be within the range of say solar panels and and wind turbines and this sort of thing um that's a good question and i don't think we have i wish i could say yes it's definitely going to be cheaper um or be on the same level as uh, i think i think wind and solar th themselves have uh, some efficiency issues uh, simply because they don't produce energy on demand and averaged over time, they produce much less than the installed power. Uh, so they themselves have their own issues with, with cost and uh, are, are, uh, they need, they live uh, to a large degree from um, public uh, funding, so from support. Could I ask, what, yeah. what do you mean by installed power, sorry? So for example, for windmills, uh, if you build a five megawatt windmill, you'll say I've installed five megawatt of wind power, but, the wind doesn't blow all the time and sometimes it blows too much and they have to, to turn it off. And uh, in the end, it produces maybe uh, one, one tenth of that on average. Mm -hmm. uh, so there's installed power and there's produced power and those are not the same. Installed power is what can the, what can the windmill or the solar panel deliver under perfect circumstances. That, mm -hmm. That's the installed power. And and the actual produced power has two problems. One is that it might be producing at the wrong time. Uh, and the other one is you can't actually, pre you can't actually over time, you will, you will pre be producing on average much less than the installed power. And there are papers on that, um, that, that show, for example, in Germany, where we have a lot of wind power, statistically, you can see these fluctuations and uh, you, can, you can statistically uh, calculate how much is it producing on average. Um, installed power of the fusion plant would basically be equivalent to its maximum power if you want to run it like that, because it can. Um, yeah. So that's the beauty of that. Um, but in terms of how much it's going to cost, uh, I think eventually the cost will come down where it is competitive, um, or vice versa. We will play. We will also be paying a premium on the fact that it is such a a safe and um, benign source of energy in terms of CO2 emissions and, and uh, pollution that we might set our standards higher than we, when we have the possibility for producing um, immense amounts of, of, of safe and environmentally friendly energy, we will be willing to raise the price um, or say that's going to be our standard now. We only produce mm -hmm. Uh, CO2 free. We only produce with, mm -hmm. with benign environmental consequences. That alone might raise the energy prices. Um, so the energy price itself is not something that isn't going to be adjusting to what we demand from the energy um, and is likely, I think, to go up. It certainly will go up if we rely only on renewables. Uh, they are more expensive. And maybe it's the right thing to do in the moment at the moment. Uh, so uh, that's why I, I'm giving you like I wish I could just say it's gonna be dirt cheap. We're gonna we're gonna be producing and, <laughs> and nobody's ever gonna pay anything for energy anymore. I don't know that. Um, the first the first pilot plants are gonna be expensive. They're gonna be so expensive that they themselves are not going to be making money on the energy market. Uh, especially the way it's run now with a lot of subsidies, unless they, they got enormous subsidies. Um, but all of this is costly because it's high, high tech. It's complicated three-dimensional things. It's uh, advanced steels. It's uh, the newest superconductors. These are all things that will come down in cost dramatically once you have a market for them. Things like high temperature superconductors there is no mass market for them. There are niches that need them and will pay a premium for high temperature superconductor performance. Uh, but there's no mass market for this. It's not like uh, millions of kilometers of tape being produced every day and uh, everybody's, mm -hmm. everybody's using high temperature superconductors now. 
because the market isn't there. Um, so it's a little bit of a chicken and egg uh, question. Yeah. Because once you get the get it going, once you have the customers, um, the producers are going to be there, and the customers yeah. are saying, "Well, I don't see any producers, so I am not going to go down that path." At the moment, it's like this with high temperature superconductors, for example. That that uh, we're concerned to try and build, a, for example, a power plant, uh, a stellarator power plant based on high temperature superconductors. If we look at from which company would be be able to buy the coils? Not all of them would need to scale up uh, to mm -hmm. meet our demand, mm -hmm. because we would be one of their only customers uh, at that yeah. level. Now, imagine once this is rolled out and and uh, you're producing your 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 fiftieth or or five hundredth power plant. Those companies are already there. They're mass producing these things. The amount of uh, superconductor itself is incredibly tiny. It, these are inc very, very thin layers, micrometer layers of uh, of superconductor, which itself is expensive, but it's not a whole lot of material, but it's a complicated process that hasn't been scaled up yet. Um, so I think it's a very difficult question to answer right now because um, there's the chicken and egg dynamic that if we were asking for it, they would be giving it to us and the prices would come down. Uh, but we would wish that uh, some other customer would come in and, 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 and make that happen for us so that we could have a proper costing point and say, there is a mature industry here. It's not gonna come down. It's come down a factor of 20 in price and we we can plan with that. I would love, I guess I would of... love that. Uh, but we're not there yet. It's sort of an unfair question, right? I'm, I'm asking you, compare this technology to a, a mature technology and tell me in the future what the prices are going to yeah. be. <laughs> and also, I suppose, one thing I didn't really think about in the in the question is just that, okay, if you look at solar and wind, they take huge amounts of space. I mean, you, if you're flying over Germany, you can look down, you can see these huge uh, fields right. of, of uh, wind turbines. And then on top of that, I guess if you only had renewables as they currently stand, you'd need batteries. So then you need to be mining lithium and you need to be... Uh, so there's, there's all these different cost elements that I'm not factoring into the question, um, which make it a little bit unfair, I suppose. So it, it, even as it currently stands, maybe it is still cheaper if you take into account these other hidden costs, let's say. Yeah, I, I don't think it's un, an unfair question, but it's unfortunately not a question I can give you a good answer to because, uh, yeah, there's just too many uncertainties and a lot of it is uh, biting itself in the tail. If there were already a fusion industry, the prices would be different. Um, and uh, how big of the, is that industry going to be? Is it is it going to be uh, world dominant and there will be a, an enormous production of uh, of of the main components of this uh, very mature technology, what are the prices going to land at? That's that's kind of why we need, uh, we've been needing public funding and why we continue to need investors, also private investors who have some philanthropic angle on it, who, who re realize that they may need to pay upfront for something that will really change the world and they might actually also make a lot of money down the road, but it isn't the only motivation for them to go in, into this. I think if the if your only motivation is I want to be incredibly rich, uh, rich by by capturing this uh, carbon free energy source market, you will tend into directions of, of fusion solutions that are more speculative, uh, a lot more speculative than. For example, the stellarator. You will go into these directions where, for example, the plasma itself creates the confining field that it needs, um, and that the coils are not so important and not so expensive, and the whole thing can be shrunk. Maybe um, you might go to more advanced fuels uh, where you don't have the neutron uh, radiation. If you fuse po uh, protons and, and, and boron 11, uh, you actually have a fusion reaction that produces no neutrons, there is zero um, radioactivity uh, and it will produce energy, but it is orders of magnitude 
more difficult to reach than deuterium tritium. Mm. So there are companies that are based on that, that, that are saying, that's what we want to do. It can be small and modular. We don't need the uh, neutron shielding. We don't need to worry about decommissioning something that's somewhat radioactive. Um, and they see if we just are lucky with the physics, we can make enormous amounts of money over maybe a 10 year time scale. So that kind of investor is gonna go to that kind of project. And uh, um, I can't excite them about a stellarator uh, that is gonna be a relatively large power plant that's gonna need expensive magnets and 3D technology. Um, mm -hmm. uh, that's gonna have some uh, engineering uh, to, be, to be done for it before we can even get rolling. I don't think that uh, private investors of, of that kind, I think the private investors that might step into this uh, scene, into stellarators, will have a, um, a philanthropic angle on it. Uh, it, it uh, they, they will be wanting to also save the planet and ensure they want to have a piece of the cake if this thing uh, becomes uh, a disruptive, uh, fantastic technology. Um, so I think that's that's those are the kinds of, of uh, investors who would who would come in and um, and the others are, are going and, the, and there is a reason why when you look at the landscape of, of uh, startup companies we do have at this point what's nice about it is that we have a spectrum now it used to be only small modular very optimistic on the physics front um, that would claim that you can do this with a 10 million investment or, or 50 million investment, and you will have energy production in, on a five-year time scale. And those of us who've worked in the field for a long time uh, and see that that's unlikely to happen. Um, I, and I wish them well. I really hope they will because we need this energy source. I don't need to be the person who had the right idea. But I don't believe in them. I wouldn't. I wouldn't quit my day job for it. I wouldn't take that deal myself, even if I were given, given the ten million and uh, and, and told, look, you can, you can. Why can't you do this? It's easier than building a accelerator. I would say because I don't believe in it. <laughs> um, so, right. So, so I think that what's happening is that these these small startup uh, things are now being complemented now by by bigger, uh, more credible. Uh, fusion endeavors, uh, which are more likely to succeed, which have somewhat longer timescales and also require larger investments. You've brought the conversation full circle back to exactly where I started at the beginning, which is mm -hmm. good. I, what I want to do is, so I've asked you the question about the, so I, I, I want to wrap up and, 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 and complete the conversation. Okay. Uh, and then I want to ask a couple of questions that don't really fit into the stream of, of, uh, uh, the discussion, but so I, I asked you about uh, the magical funding fairy and and <laughs> what you could achieve. What's the real? So if if you could uh, paint a picture of how you see things going uh, from this point on over, say the next couple of decades, uh, how how do you think? What, what's the realistic path that you can see uh, things taking uh, towards commercialization at this point? Uh, so I would see. Um, governments or private investors stepping in in a bigger way than they are now. So that uh, let's say that we get a order magnitude increase in uh, in funding and fusion that would allow things to run in parallel. So, so let's take that scenario uh, that money is uh, not an issue anymore, that, that there is sufficient money that one could get started. Uh, one, would, one would start this engineering design, one would uh, during that process, identify what are potential showstoppers. You asked this, and I'm very positive about the stellarator in that respect, but nonetheless, it could be that during an engineering design, you realize, oh, we actually do have an issue with uh, the tritium inventory, for example, and that we do need to think about new materials, um, or we do need to develop this or that. Uh, an engineering design itself will will help clarify a number of these things. So that's what I would start with. At, at the point of, uh, of, of a finished engineering design uh, where you're, you feel that you have retired all significant risks, 
you would then begin to build one or possibly most likely several different kinds of power plants. I, I don't think uh, even if I'm in love with the Stellarator, I don't think we should stop the development everywhere else um, just because uh, I see their flaws. Um, they might have some way of coming around and, and, and fixing those things. So we would be going in parallel with different concepts, which we would then be building um, a, a pilot plant, a thing that would actually be mm. producing uh, electricity that would be consuming um, deuterium and tritium uh, by the use of deuterium and lithium coming in, would demonstrate that you can do the fuel cycle, would demonstrate that uh, you can keep the burn uh, stable and basically uh, show that this is possible. The next generation after that would be, how do we make this commercially viable? What are the things that we did here that don't scale well? What are the things where we need to come up with a different engineering solution so that it can be produced much quicker, much uh, less expensive uh, or with, with more confidence? Uh, where are the engineering, um, where's the low hanging fruit in terms of, of optimizing the system uh, for, for, for commercial rollout? Uh, so that would be the next generation would then be a deployment of, of systems that uh, would compete in the market, maybe with some subsidies, maybe not, depending on how well this, this first stage goes. And depending on how the world is, is thinking about doing uh, producing energy, how much of a premium it will put on, on actually uh, keeping CO2 emissions, for example, uh, low. It might already be a commercial rollout, uh, or it might be a somewhat commercial rollout. There will be places in the world where it's already a viable energy source and even competitive, and people are, are clamoring for it. And there'll be other parts of the world where they're saying, look, this is too expensive for us. We don't we're not on board, uh, we can't, uh, it's it's not for us. Um, there might also be, yeah, right. So there are places where where you have other solutions that are, that are, that are okay. People, there are people who have, uh, um, yeah. Hydro. hydro, exactly. I was just uh, looking for the word hydro. That you might actually be able to come up with with ways of storing energy from 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 uh, from your wind farms that um, will allow them to be more economical than they are now, uh, that you can store when they're overproducing and uh, and bring it back into the system. There might be other solutions else uh, in various places. Maybe fusion initially in the rollout will be a few places where uh, they need a lot of energy in a small area. Uh, you you mentioned uh, that that most of these uh, other concepts are, they take up a lot of area. Um, a fusion power plant is not gonna be, it's not gonna be bigger than any other power plant. Um, this, which means it's not gonna be small when you look at it, as if you walk around in it, it's gonna be big because the infrastructure of, of, of producing a gigawatt is, is gonna be uh, substantial, but it's something you can fit, mm. fit in at the outskirts of a big city. And, and that whole city can get it's uh, energy from from one or two power plants. Um, so so there will be uh, densely populated areas, for example, that will will uh, will be ripe for the fusion power plants, and there'll be areas uh, that are that are not so densely populated where they'll say, well, we're going to do something else. We're, we uh, mm. we we have the space for for the alternatives. We have the uh, the wind, or we have a lot of sunshine. Um, we're not going to want to go on the fusion grid. And there'll, there'll be niches where, where fusion's kind of like the only possibility. If you want to go into like interstellar travel, the, actually, that, that seems, you now we're, we're entering science fiction. But the only thing that really will, will work there is probably fusion. Um, but that I think is somewhat off. So let's uh, let's take that off there. No, 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 no. Let's let's stick back in here. <laughs> okay. <laughs> that was one of the other questions that was outside the discussion. I wanted I to ask you okay. about. <laughs> All right. Do, uh, I was going to ask you about other technological uh, possibility or other applications. Mm -hmm. So do you, do you see this as being a realistic? So in the future, we're going to be powering uh spacecraft off of fusion reactors is this uh so um let me let me my own personal opinion about uh interstellar travel um or 
even travel of humans um, to the outskirts of our own uh, solar system is that I don't think this is something that we want to do anytime soon. We have big problems at home. Um, and and the, the distances are just enormous. Uh, even if you can travel near the speed of light, uh, going to some other solar system to explore it will mean that when you come back, your your whole family has uh, is gone. You might you might meet your your, your <laughs> you might meet your your uh, grandchildren. Um, you might not yourself have aged that much if you're really traveling near the speed of light, but uh, you will have said goodbye to your family. And uh, the chances of finding something interesting somewhere else is is also fairly remote. So, so personally, I'm not one who's pushing for us to go into deep space anytime soon. Mm. But if you were to, uh, you need <laughs> a lot of thrust with not a whole lot of fuel. And the processes, the process that has the most energy per kilogram is fusion. There's only one that's more than that, and that's having antimatter. Antimatter matter uh, is a lot more dense than that, but that brings up a whole bunch of issues. Um, how, how you create it and how you separate them from not an, an, uh, annihilating too soon, and um, that's... Uh, I think of we make even less of that than tritium. Oh yeah. Oh way. yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Oh yeah. You'd have to call up so uh, yes, yes. Uh, so so uh, but the 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 realistic near term and the, I think when we near term is not really my lifetime I think for interstellar travel would be a fusion uh, driven uh, acceleration method. For that reason because the fuel uh energy density is the highest. Um, and for a, a deep space mission, you need you need to have a you need to have that very high energy density so that you can accelerate and decelerate and all that. Is is tritium uh on the available on the moon? Oh, or you, could you also just do direct? You're thinking of helium three, uh, I think. Hit. Which is which is oh, on the moon. Sorry. Um, tritium oh, because it has this 12 year uh, half-life basically isn't available anywhere. Um, uh, there is a little bit of it produced, but since it decays um, over 12 years and the production rate is small, unless you ask for it in a, in a fission power plant, uh, tritium is, is essentially not there. But we don't, we don't need it for the reasons I mentioned. But helium-3 is on the moon. That's a stable isotope of helium. Um, and uh, we could mine uh, the moon for helium-3, and there is a fusion process between deuterium and helium-3, which is um, quite, quite nice, uh, quite advantageous. It is more difficult to reach the burn than for deuterium-tritium. There's a reason why we're focusing on deuterium-tritium, and that is that it is by far the easiest reaction to get to burn, uh, get to ignition. Um, but de deuterium, deuterium and deuterium helium-3 fusion reactions are the next in line. And so we can imagine that once we've uh, perfected the DT fusion reactor, other uh, engineering and technical advances will have made it possible to move to better fuels, move to, to deuterium and, and, and uh, helium-3, for example, or just deuterium itself will will already be a win. There's less neutrons. Um, they are less energetic. Um, in particular, they're less energetic. Deuterium helium-3 has uh, similar advantages. Um, there are many, many fusion processes. Uh, uh, well, I take that back. There are several fusion processes that we can use after deuterium tritium, which have advantages over DT, only that they would require even better confinement even higher temperatures. Um, so they are simply more difficult to come by. And for that reason, we should focus on DT and make that work and, and help us transition out of carbon free and then continue to work on even better fusion concepts so that we can transition to these other fuels. And the ultimate one is proton boron 11 that, that I mentioned earlier, which is completely mm -hmm. Um, neutron free is completely radio radioactivity free and produces 
three alpha particles, three helium uh, nuclei as your waste. Um, but it is um, yeah. a stretch in the physics. Which we can then use for other applications. Yes. Uh, helium is uh, universally useful. We also use it as a coolant in the power plant itself. We can have it in balloons. We also release it into the atmosphere. It'll eventually evaporate out. <laughs> it's not something that will accumulate. This is, uh, I'm sort of upset that I'm not going to live long enough to see us mining helium-3 from the moon and <laughs> half of these amazing Who knows? Um, you never know. And if there are some real, some other breakthroughs, uh, I mean, some of the things, um, some of the things that I, that we talked about today, had, had they just been kind of uh, postulated by me uh, to, 20 years ago saying, we will have superconductors that can go to three times higher field. Uh, we will have machines that can just print uh, three dimensional structures that are completely, totally complicated also out of metals. Um, you'd be saying, yeah, yeah, I, I agree. We will eventually, but not in our lifetimes. Um, <laughs> or, or why do you think that's gonna happen anytime soon? Um, mm. So, I don't know what's on the horizon. I wouldn't rule out the possibility that uh, that that you uh, or even I would would see us mining the moon for for helium three. I don't think it's likely. I agree, um, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and I'm not I'm not aiming aiming uh, for that scenario with uh, the research I'm doing. Um, but I wouldn't rule it out. Crazy things have happened. Escaped Sapiens.